Well, it is a pleasure to be here. I admit that looking out at you, I don't recognize many of you, <laughs> uh, which is as it should be. But I do know that I spoke to at least two people on the way in, called you by name, and you didn't know who I was. <laughs> so, so we have a little bit of getting to know each other, obviously. I was quite honored when David got in touch with me to invite me to come as the anniversary preacher, but I, I questioned him about it. I said, are you really serious in an invitation like this? Why would anyone invite an octogenarian to come as a, an anniversary preacher in the middle of winter? Well, he pointed out he didn't know me. All he knew about me was the picture of me that hangs out in the lobby area. That picture was taken probably 36 years ago. <laughs> so on the way in, I wanted to check that picture, but first of all, I veered into what is now, I guess, the coffee area, but was the sanctuary in my days, to stand for a moment at the window that is in memory of our daughter. And that brought such warm memories back of the way this congregation supported us in a difficult moment in our lives. And then I went on to the picture that hangs out there in the, uh, well, it goes by different names, the portrait of rogues or whatever you wish to call it. <laughs> And as I looked at it, I, I certainly saw that there were a number of differences. Uh, improvements, I would like to think. Uh, you know, I looked at it and I realized my hair, which used to be a very dark color, is now this lovely, well, halo-like, um, which I, I would hope means that I've been growing in holiness through the years. And, and you may have noticed that I seem to have more forehead than I used to. Yeah. More brain power, surely. It has to be that. And those of you who do remember me may remember how I would bounce up and down the chancel steps back in those days. But maybe you noticed I walked very carefully today with more dignity, with more, well, I would say with more reverence. So I'm trying to say improvements along the way. It's all a matter of attitude though, isn't it? I'm older, older than some of you thought I might get to be, older than I thought I would get to be, but I feel blessed and I feel content because it's all a matter of attitude, which reminds me of that wonderful story of an older woman who had been over a period of time losing her hair and coming to cope with it. And one morning when she woke up, she got out of bed, looked in the mirror and discovered there were only three hairs left on her head. And she thought, I think I'll braid my hair today. <laughs> and, and she did and, and it was a good day. And some time passed, and another morning, when she got up and looked, only two hairs left on her head. Uh, I'll part my hair down the middle today. <laughs> and life was good. Still on another day, there was only one hair left. And she thought, then I will wear it as a ponytail. And she did, and she had a fun-filled day. But the very next day when she woke up, no hair left. Thank goodness, she said, I don't have to do my hair today. <laughs> now that is attitude. And I want to come back to that a couple of times. An, an anniversary service is meant to be a celebration it can be a celebration of various things. It can be a celebration of our past, looking back to where we were, who we were, and where we've come from. 
or it can be a celebration of who we are right now. Or indeed, it can be an adventurous celebration of looking to the future with hope or sometimes with worry. But when a former minister is invited as the anniversary preacher, that creates a different dynamic. Then the focus may so easily shift to the past. And it becomes a wonderful opportunity to wallow in memories. And we have some good memories that we could share. I'd like to know right now, put your hands up. Were you here when I was here as minister? Let's see the hands. Okay. Good for you. The saints you've hung in. Good for you. But I don't want to wallow in memories today. Or I suppose I could tell you about all I've done in ministry since I left here, but you'd find that boring. At any rate, the occasion isn't about me, it's about you. So what kind of message should I bring on this, your 64th anniversary? Well, I began by reflecting on my life as an octogenarian, trying to put a positive spin on it and suggesting that attitude is all important. In the same way, I think, I should just reflect on what I sense happening in our beloved United Church, hopefully doing it in a positive way, trying to help you to focus on who and what you are as a congregation. We're all aware of closing churches these days. It's happening everywhere. The church I worship in will be closing soon. And it can get very depressing. But, you know, this isn't something new. This has been going on. When I was a student minister, I served a pastoral charge just across the bay, Ameliasburg, Massasauga, Mountain View. And as I was ordained, those three churches were combined into one, Wesley, which survived until last year. When I was ordained in 1967, I went to the Maritimes, and I was given responsibility for four small congregations along the Minas Basin. But the day before I arrived, there had been two pastoral charges there with eight congregations. So it's been going on. So maybe what we need to say, it's a little bit of the three hairs, two hairs, one hair. Deal with it. It's what it is. We deal with it. We're also hearing a lot about the national reorganization of the church. And some people say, what a waste of time. Get on with the work. But for a long time, we have said we've had too many levels of governance in our church. The local congregation, the presbytery, the conference, the general council, and all the effort that went into keeping those going. We're stripping down for action, I would like to think. That's putting more of a positive look on it. But I really want not to talk about out there so much as to concentrate my comments more on the congregational life in our individual congregations. When I went to Trinity United Church in Cannington, where I was before coming to Eastminster, I was told there about one of the saints of the church. His name was Ted Apps, and he loved his church. And Ted, when he was walking down the street to, to Trinity for any reason, a meeting or the service, when he met friends, acquaintances, he'd say to them, well, I'm off to the powerhouse. What a great picture of what a church is meant to be, a powerhouse. Have you heard of the Livermore light bulb? Anyone here heard about the Livermore light bulb? Well, apparently, people from all over the world visit fire station number six in Livermore, California. Why? Because they want to see the world's most famous light bulb. And that light bulb is a 60-watt bulb that was installed in 1901 and is still 
shining today, 118 years later. Now, there's a variety of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is that it has never been turned off and on, off and on. All that time, it has remained connected to the source of power. We hear these days a number of people talking about living off the grid. And it certainly has uh, an appeal when we get our um, monthly bill for electricity. If we could only live off the grid, produce the power we need through solar and wind power, wouldn't that be wonderful? But you've got to have a certain frame of mind for that. It wouldn't work for me. I'd, I'd freeze in the winter. So I prefer to live on the grid to stay connected to the source of power. Not only electric power, but the power that gives strength for our living. A church that is made up of individual people who stay connected to the power, living on the grid, that church has the potential to become a real, a real powerhouse. And the question is, is Eastminster a powerhouse? A powerhouse for you, a place where you find yourself being empowered for living. It should be. But every one of us is tempted from time to time to live off the grid. You know how we go searching for power elsewhere, maybe through our careers, through travel, through our bank accounts, you name it. We, we have places that we go to find meaning, to give power to our lives, and that's living off the grid, and that weakens the powerhouse, weakens the church. Now, I don't want to suggest that staying connected just means going to church. Going to church is it's pleasant, or it's a duty, Sometimes it's a great privilege, but it's not necessarily staying connected. There's all the other things that go into it. It's staying connected through prayer, through meaningful fellowship with other believers, through wrestling with the truths and the hard truths that we find in the Bible, or maybe being lifted up by the beauty of music or the glories of nature. I guess what I'm trying to say is we need to be the church, not just go to church. We need to be the church. And for the church, it's very important to be doing good things. Uh, you know, that's, that's part of the essence of who we are. It's the essence of Christianity. And I'm sure Eastminster has many wonderful programs where you are reaching out into the community around you here to empower others. Uh, certainly the church I go to. Uh, we're involved now in Homeward Bound. We're involved uh, supporting the School for Young Mothers. We're into uh, food nourishment through uh, community gardens and one roof dinners and things like that. All these are essential. Absolutely good and essential. But equally important is maintaining our connection as individual believers and as a congregation of faith, our connection to God, who is our source of power, the power that energizes, nurtures, renews, and challenges us. Doing and being, doing and being, they're equally important for Christians. As a retired minister, one who now Sunday by Sunday sits in the pew and tries to participate in the varied life of the church, I worry that we get these two essentials, the doing and the being, out of balance. We're really good at the doing part, but we often neglect the being. Earlier in the service, we heard read a passage 
from the letter to the Ephesians. I'm going to ask you to listen to part of it again. I want you to listen to it as if you were a member of the church in Ephesus. And when I say church, it's probably a small gathering of people in someone's home. And you're living in a city where Christianity is considered with suspicion, where it's dangerous to be a Christian. I want you to listen to what the letter writer is saying to that struggling congregation in Ephesus. Listen to what the letter writer is saying to you. He writes, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints, with all the believers, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, in other words, the full dimension, and to know the love of Christ that passes all understanding, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That is the letter writer's hope and prayer for the church at Ephesus, and indeed, that would be his hope and prayer for Eastminster. That through the goodness of God, you would be made strong inwardly. That you might be rooted and grounded in love. That you might grasp the fullness of that eternal mystery of love that we dare to name God that you might be filled with the fullness of God. What an amazing vision, picture, if you will, of the church as a powerhouse. That's a picture of what Eastminster ought to be like, a place of empowerment. And that is, on this anniversary Sunday, your challenge to strive to be that kind of congregation, a powerhouse for yourselves and for your community at large. So be it. Amen.